grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship with us at Christ Church by the Sea on this fourth Sunday of Easter as we celebrate Christ's resurrection and God's victory over sin and death. We're glad you're here, and we hope this worship service will be a blessing to you. At Christ Church by the Sea, we believe that all people are of equal value and dignity since God loves all persons without exception. Whoever you are, you are welcome here. If you are with us for the first time, we ask that you sign the registration pads in each pew so that we can stay in touch with you. If you have a prayer request, please fill out a blue card and hand it to the usher during the opening hymn. And we ask that you remain seated for the postlude and then join us for refreshments and fellowship after the service. And now let us join our hearts and spirits in worshiping God. Let us join together in saying responsively our call to worship. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Indeed, Indeed Christ, Christ has been raised, raised from the, the dead, dead by the, the glory of God, God so, so that, that we might walk in newness of, of life. life. For this perishable body, must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Death, death, death has been swallowed up in victory. victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Let, Let us praise, praise God, God for Christ's resurrection from the dead, and, and rejoice in the new life made possible for us through Christ. Christ. Please stand for the opening hymn, if you are able, and remain standing for our congregational prayer and the passing of the peace. Our opening hymn is, This Is My Father's World, page 144 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
let us join our hearts together in prayer. God, God of power, power and majesty, majesty, on that first Easter morning, you raised Jesus from the dead and, and delivered him from death's destruction. Through his resurrection, you have opened the gates of everlasting life to us as well. Grant that we who celebrate the joyous message of that first Easter may always live our lives in hopeful anticipation of our resurrection. May we die daily to sin so as to live in faithfulness to you, our Creator and our Redeemer. Through Jesus Christ, our risen and triumphant Lord. Amen. My hands are cold, sorry. <laughs> Joyce, you're such a shining light. It's always so good. That's exactly what she is.
I want to share a few announcements with you. The first is that the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, which is the worldwide gathering of our denomination, is currently meeting in North Carolina. And so we want to pray for the delegates from the various countries of the world that have gathered there as they meet to shape the vision of our mission and ministry for the next four years. So many people, including our bishop and our district superintendent, are at that meeting in North Carolina, and our thoughts and prayers are with them. Tonight, we'll be having another evening of sharing of hearts and minds here in our sanctuary, and we'll have two psychotherapists from the area, Dr. Lauren Richardson and Dr. Lauren Jolly, speaking with us about their concerns having to do with trauma and religion and spirituality. So I invite you all to come uh, for an informal conversation. We have these once a month with various leaders in the community here at 6 p.m. And then next Sunday, our own Rob Powell is having a birthday, so give Rob a call or send him a card this week. Let us join our voices together as we come before God in prayer by singing number 328 in the United Methodist hymnal, Surely the Presence of the Lord. Let us take a moment of silent prayer with our God. Our good and gracious God, we come before you this day with songs of praise and joy as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Through Christ, you have assured us of your victory over sin and death so that we might become new people who trust in you. You've made it possible for us to live without fear of death so that we may live boldly and confidently serving you with wholehearted devotion and loving our neighbors selflessly as Jesus called us to do. As we bear witness to the good news of Easter, may your light shine in all the dark places of this world. May the good news of Christ's resurrection bring hope to those in despair relief to those who are suffering, peace to those in turmoil, gladness to those who are sad, and love to those who are lonely or whose hearts are filled with hatred and bitterness. Teach us, O oh God, to live and die as Jesus did, and teach us each day to pray just as he taught us, saying, 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us stand and join our voices in singing This is the Day, number 657 in the Methodist hymnal. Let us listen for the word of God addressing us in these words of Holy Scripture. From Psalm 62, verses 1 through 2 and 5 through 12. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall never be shaken. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord. From Corinthians 7, verses 29 through 31. First Corinthians, sorry. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as they, though they had no, no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. May God bless the hearing of these words from Scripture. An important American theologian named Reinhold Niebuhr once said that there are two verses in the Bible that are especially difficult to believe and to make one's own. 
I, I've written this quote at the top of our order of service. You can read it. The two verses in the Bible that are especially difficult to believe and to make one own are these. The first, do not be anxious about your life. And the second is, love your enemies. So how many of you, raise your hand, are not anxious about your lives? And how many of you love your enemies? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> I agree with Niebuhr. These are very hard sayings of Jesus. And let's face it, who can really believe them, let alone live according to them? Aren't we all anxious about our lives most of the time? And to tell the truth, don't we really hate our enemies, even if we're too polite to admit it? I know from my own life just how much anxiety can consume me and that even hatred can fill my heart. Yet just imagine how great our lives could be if we were free from anxiety and hatred. Wouldn't that be terrific? You see, when we're anxious and when our hearts are filled with hate, we are in bondage to the world. Our anxiety keeps us tied to those things that worry us, and our hatred keeps us bound to those people we hate. Yet if we could be free of bondage to the world, we don't have to leave the world. We simply have to let go of anxiety and hatred, since these are what keep us in chains. And the gospel, the good news about Christ, is that we are offered this possibility from God. Yes, we can be free from the world even while still living in the world, and that's the good news. If we really believe the Easter message that God has raised Jesus from the dead, then we are enabled to live without anxiety about our lives in the world and to live without hatred for other people in the world. That's God's offer to us, if we would but embrace it. And in our readings from Scripture today, we have two examples of this freedom from bondage to the world that can be ours, one from the Old Testament and the other from the New Testament. Let's look at the New Testament passage first. In his letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul writes that the present form of this world is passing away. What does he mean by this? Well, he's pointing out that everything in the world is transitory. That is, nothing in the world is permanent. Everything passes away. That's why when we are so attached to the things in this world, whether through anxiety or hatred, we are in bondage to decay and death. We are in bondage to what passes away. And deep down, we all know the truth of Paul's statement since it's confirmed in our own experience of living. We feel that life and time are slipping away from us. Consider a few examples. Retirement may be an occasion for us to look back on our career and be proud of our accomplishments, but it's also a reminder that our careers are now behind us and that we have been replaced on the job by younger men and women. Or when our kids grow up and leave home for the first time, we can be happy and proud now that they're adults and can make it on their own, but there's also a tinge of sadness that they no longer need us anymore in quite the same way as they did before. And of course, we all know the deep grief that comes from losing those we love through death. Moreover, we also know that death waits for each one of us who are still alive. Yes, the present form of this world is passing away, and who can deny the truth of this statement? And yet we do everything we can to deny it, or at least to push the awareness of it as far away from us as possible. When we look in the mirror and see wrinkles and gray hair, we are reminded that youth 
has slipped away from us. We may use wrinkle cream and color our hair, but we know that we can't turn back the clock. Time moves in one direction only. As a child, I used to look forward to my birthday, but now my birthday reminds me that I have less time ahead of me than I have behind me. Every year on my birthday, I ask myself, whatever became of that young man I used to be? <laughs> yes, the present form of this world is passing away. This impermanence of all things in the world tempts us to be anxious about our lives. So we desperately try to secure our lives against anxiety. Yet Jesus tells us not to be anxious about our lives. But how? How can we live without anxiety about our lives? It seems impossible, and it is impossible so long as we rely on ourselves and our own resources to master this anxiety about the impermanence of life in the world. Yet the gospel offers us a freedom from this anxiety if we will but trust in God. Because God alone is eternal, and thus God alone is the source of permanence in our lives. Trust in God gives us the courage to face the transient and permanent character of this world, including death. And this is the good news of Easter. Now, in the Old Testament, the psalmist sings, God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My refuge is in God. I've always been struck by the psalmist's words, I shall never be shaken. In the midst of a world in which everything is passing away, we can find our rest in God, who never passes away. We too can therefore say with the psalmist, I shall never be shaken. What the psalmist describes is the faith in God of which the Apostle Paul also speaks. Like Paul, the psalmist has a critical view of the world's pomp and glory. The psalmist says that even the rich and powerful people of high estate are a delusion, lighter than a breath, for they too will eventually pass away. Therefore, we should not place our confidence in wealth. The psalmist says, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Instead, the psalmist encourages us to trust in God at all times, because God is our rock, our fortress, and our refuge. The psalmist teaches us that power belongs to God. Likewise, Paul instructs the Corinthians of the need to keep an inward detachment from the world, even while we are still living in the world. Paul writes, from now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For Paul, this is the nature of our freedom as Christians. We live in the world as though not. We have dealings with the world as though not. Even in our deepest grief, we grieve as though not. Even in our greatest joy, we rejoice as though not. This as though not sounds very strange at first, but it's really not that hard to understand. For example, at every wedding, which is surely an occasion of great joy, those being married promise to love one another till death do us part. But why would we even mention something as sad as death on one of the happiest occasions of our lives, if not to remind us of this truth of which the Apostle Paul speaks? Hence, we who get married 
have to love our spouse knowing that even the happiest marriage, that is one that does not end in divorce, will eventually come to an end when one of the two partners dies. And yet even when we do grieve the loss of our spouse, we eventually come to the moment when we have completed our grieving and we move on with our lives, even though that moment never comes soon enough for any of us in deep anguish over our loss, still it does come. I vividly recall a conversation with the mother of a childhood friend of mine from our church who died when he was only 15 years old. I was a pallbearer at his funeral, and I was only 15 years old as well. Decades later, she told me how devastating it was to lose her only son. She said she thought her world had ended, but somehow her life went forward. She explained, one morning I woke up and I realized that I just had no more tears left. Even our deepest grief doesn't last forever. There is more life yet for us to live. Given the transitory, impermanent character of the world and of our lives within the world, it's easy to be consumed with anxiety. But as the Bible points out, such anxiety binds us to the world that is passing away. And for that reason, the good news of the gospel offers us freedom from this bondage. Through faith in God, we can live in the world freed from bondage to the world. Hatred of enemies is also a form of bondage to the world. Yet let's face it, how difficult it is not to hate those who have hurt and wounded us. How difficult it is not to seek revenge on those who have wronged us. Jesus himself not only told us to love our enemies, but he demonstrated this love of enemies when from the cross he prayed for those who tortured and crucified him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, if only they could know, if only our enemies could feel how much they've hurt us by what they've done to us. Hatred of our enemies and desire for revenge are entirely understandable. We've all felt it. And yet it too is a form of bondage to the world. How often I have realized that my hatred of those who have wronged me has actually kept me tied to them as though I were carrying a ball and chain around my ankle. You see, forgiveness is not only for the sake of those who have sinned against us, but it's also for our own sakes, lest we be forever in bondage to them through our hatred of them and our all-consuming desire for revenge. My friends, Christ offers us this freedom from the world, from the anxiety and hatred that keep us in bondage to the world. And yet, paradoxically or surprisingly, we can still live in the world fully participating in its joys and sorrows, albeit with this important qualification, as though not. Our Christian faith in God offers us freedom from the world, but it does not lead us to be unconcerned with the world. The paradox, the surprising thing, is that our faith in God frees us from bondage to the world in order to free us for responsible participation in the world. I can look at myself in the mirror and see the signs of aging and not be anxious because I know that I belong to God in youth and old age, in life and in death. I can hold the hand of a wife grieving her husband at the cemetery because I can accept my own inevitable death as well as the death of those I love, knowing that God is eternal and that real power belongs to God and not to me. I can forgive my enemies because I know that God has forgiven me my sins, all the ways that I have hurt my fellow human beings through my own wrongdoing and betrayal. 
I can accept my own failures and limitations because faith in God releases me from the compulsive need to be perfect and to make something of myself. I can accept criticism from others because God frees me from the need constantly to justify myself, to be in the right all the time. Faith in God gives me the courage to face the impermanence of my own life in the world since I trust that God cares for me and that death can never separate me from God's eternal love for me. Anxiety and hatred are forms of attachment to the world that is passing away. They keep us in bondage to the world. But Paul tells us that as Christians, we have died to the world with Christ so that we might live faithfully to God. Though we remain in the world, we're no longer in bondage to the world. Rather, we can be as those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. Our lives are ultimately not in our own hands. They are in the hands of God. And these are loving hands. And as the psalmist says, it is not only power that belongs to God, but steadfast love and fidelity. So then, let us live in the world, trusting that because it's God's world, we need not be afraid, just as none of God's creatures are to be hated. In this Easter season when we celebrate Christ's resurrection from the dead, let us never forget that this freedom is ours as beloved children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, we will bring forward our gifts, tithes, and offerings that support the ministry of this church. I want to draw your attention to a, an insert in the bulletin about donations to the food bank. These two are offerings. There are many people in our wider community who do not have sufficient nutritious food to feed themselves and their families. And so we collect food offerings here at the church. And you can bring them either to the office on a work day or you can bring them with you on a Sunday morning. There are, there are other items, please read this insert. There are other items too that many poor people need that we make possible for them to get. So in that spirit, let us worship God with our offerings, tithes, and gifts. Turn to the communion liturgy, which is another insert in your worship bulletin. Uh, Diana and Kathy, please come and assist me with communion. In the United Methodist Church, we have what's called an open communion, which means that you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to participate because we are not the hosts. Christ is the host, and Christ invites all people 
to celebrate our life together in God's world. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, O God, to give you our thanks and praise. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God. Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks to you, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ invites us, all of us, to be his guests and to dine with him. All who love him, earnestly desiring to leave their sins behind and to be given a new life, are welcome at his table. Let us proclaim the, the amazing good news. Christ, Christ lived, lived and, and died, died for us, us even, even though we were, were still sinners. sinners. This, this demonstrates God's great love for us. us. In, In the, the name, name of Jesus Christ, Christ we, we are, are forgiven, forgiven and, accepted. and accepted. And now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may this bread and this cup be for us the body and blood of Christ and the sign of Christ's real presence among us. This is the body of Christ broken for us. This is the blood of Christ shed for us. Come now, for all is prepared. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
And now open your hymnals to the very back to number 883. And let us say together the affirmation of faith. 883. Smile when you've gotten it. <laughs> let us say it together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now let us stand and sing our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation, number 529 in the Methodist Hymnal. seated. Please join us for fellowship and refreshments after the worship service. And remember that tonight at 6 p.m. we'll have an evening of sharing hearts and minds with our two guests. During the benediction, I'm sorry, after the benediction, if you, during the postlude, if you'd like to come and pray by kneeling at the rail, you're welcome to do so. 
And now let us receive the benediction, God's blessing, as we go forth. May the eternal God, who is our strength and our permanence, be your dwelling place and keep your minds and hearts in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the abundant blessings of God, the love of Christ, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Always. Amen.